I think we better start on time, as we were told that we have to be very sharp at the time that we are going to end this, this event. So let me start first with a warm good afternoon to everybody here, Excellencies, friends. My name is Ana Paula Souza, and I'm a human rights officer at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and I'll be facilitating today's discussion event, what, what human rights at 75 means for climate justice now. This event is a joint effort by the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, UNEP, UNDP, UNFPA, FAO, UNICEF, WHO, UN Women, UNECE, IOM, UNODC, ILO, ECLAC, UNHCR. We re I really made an effort to mention them all, so you can see this is really part of a joint collaboration with uh, with, the UN, uh, with the UN system. And it's uh, organized under the umbrella of the UN Environment Management Group, Issue Management Group on Human Rights and Environment. 70 years ago, in the aftermath of the Second World War, the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted the Universal Declaration uh, of Human Rights. The UDHR is a milestone document that envisioned a world in which human beings can flourish free from fear or want, where human rights provide a blueprint both for preventing conflict and for promoting sustainable peace and development. Today's event brings us together from all corners of the world with different, vi different visions and roles to reflect together what needs to be done to ensure present and future generations have a fair chance to thrive here at COP28 and beyond. According to the best available science, we are approaching a critical threshold in the climate system from which it will be difficult to return. In this regard, climate justice and rights-based approaches plays a critical role with the supporting evidence for the effectiveness of these approaches in the assessments of the IPCC AR6 report. Our speakers today will explore how rights-based and gender-sensitive and gender-responsive approaches, including climate litigation, lead to more effective and sustainable climate action. Using the words of High Commissioner Volker Turk, human rights is a force to reckon with, not because it serves the interests of the powerful, but because it has captured the imagination of the powerless. We have here a fantastic lineup gathered today who will be invited to examine how integrating human rights obligations in climate laws, policies, programs, and actions can ensure accountability for those responsible for climate change and justice for those harmed by it. Few clearinghouse rules. As all UNFCCC events, this event is being broadcast live. We have an hour and a half to cover an ambitious agenda, so I would like to ask our speakers to ensure your remarks speak no more than four to five minutes. This should give the audience an opportunity to exchange comments or questions with you. If you go past the allocated time, I will let you know. <laughs> Apologies in advance, as I'm aware how hard it is to keep your thoughts, to our thoughts, to the point when we have so much to share and we are so passionate about what we are sharing. Oh, and for all of you who will stay with us through the end, get yourselves ready for a treat. Without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Mao Condalese, Climate Attaché of Vanuatu in New York, who will speak on behalf of, our, of Your Excellency Half Regen Vanu, Minister of Climate Change, Adaptation, Meteorology, and Geohazards, Energy, Environment, and Disaster Risk, Risk Management for Vanuatu, for his initial remarks. Please, you have the floor. Good afternoon, uh, colleagues, excellencies, distinguished guests. It's uh, indeed an honor to present, uh, to make this introductory remark, remarks on behalf of my minister, who unfortunately uh, is juggling uh, other engagements. Uh, without much further ado, welcome uh, everybody. I'd like to thank the human rights, the UN Human Rights, UN Environment, and the 12 other UN partner organizations, I won't go through uh, all the names, as well as the UN Environment Management Group, Issue Management Group on Human Rights and the Environment for the invitation to speak at today's event on what human rights at 75 means for climate justice now. Today's event 
focusing on accountability and access to justice for climate harms touches upon the issues incredibly important to the people of Vanuatu and others around the world, experiencing firsthand the worst impacts of climate change. Vanuatu is proud to have led the initiative to request an advisory opinion of the Advisory International Court of Justice on the obligations of states in respect of climate change. The Prime Minister of Vanuatu introduced the resolution earlier this year to the General Assembly, expressing the hope that all peoples of the United Nations, acting through their governments, could set aside their differences and work together to tackle climate change. The resolution speaks the resolution itself speaks and reflects the initiative of the Pacific Island students fighting for climate change and a cross-regional grouping of states showing how people exercising their rights can work together in the pursuit of climate justice. It was also adopted by consensus reflecting universal acceptance of the need for clarification of the obligations of states in respect of climate change. The resolution explicitly references human rights obligations and we believe the, obli the application of human rights obligations to climate action is critical. Indeed, the IPCC has said as much, noting that, that rights-based approaches lead to more effective and sustainable outcomes. Importantly, they are legally binding. People have a human right to access justice and effective remedy. In the context of climate change, this and other rights have not been honored. The climate crisis is a human rights crisis, one which only human rights-based solutions can help address. And we look forward to the outcome of the ICJ process and are pleased to note that many states are engaging with the process and a large number of human rights texts have been submitted to the court for its consideration by the Human Rights Office and others. And we are also pleased that around the world, people are going to the courts, to governments, to polls and demanding accountability for climate harms. We are cl glad that you will hear more about some of, those, some of these efforts from the distinguished speakers today and we hope that the advisory, the ICJ advisory opinion will reinforce and strengthen them. People of Vanuatu and people around the world are demanding accountability to these negotiations in courts and in every way we can. We urge you to listen. I thank you ladies and gentlemen. Uh, next, I would like to invite, also for opening remarks, uh, Mr. Jose Manuel Salazar Silinax, Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like to salute Mr. Michael Forst, a UN Special Rapporteur on Environmental Defenders on the the Arthur's Convention, um, Mr. Malcolm D'Alessa, Climate Attaché, Vanuati Permanent Mission to the UN, uh, ministers and authorities, esteemed environmental defenders, representatives of indigenous people, youth, women, trade unions, and local communities, colleagues, and friends. At the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, we are very honored to co-organize this event along with other 13 uh, UN agencies Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Climate change represents one of the greatest threats to the full exercise of human rights today. Global warming resulting in extreme weather events, biodiversity loss, soil erosion, and sea level rise have a devastating effect on our planet, but most importantly, on the rights of our people. The impacts of climate change seriously compromise our well-being and disproportionately affect those which are most vulnerable including women, indigenous peoples, children, youth, migrants, persons with disability, coastal communities, and lower income groups. 
As a result, the holding of this side event on what climate justice means today, precisely when we commemorate 75 years of the adoption of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, and by the way, also the establishment of ECLAC, this is why I'm holding this 75 number here, <laughs> Uh, human rights and the rule of law have proven to be essential for economic growth, social cohesion, environmental stewardship, and sustainable development. When the Universal Declaration was adopted back in 1948, we were still far from recognizing the right to a healthy environment. But such milestones set the foundations for what today has become a whole ecosystem of rights uh, for sustainability comprising those of life, water, sanitation, health, education, food, adequate housing, and of course, procedural rights to, of access to information, public participation, and justice. Human rights and climate go hand in hand. Not only does climate change severely impact the realization of rights, but human rights are essential to counter its effects. Hence, climate action must be consistent with human rights obligations, standards, and principles and a human rights approach must be mainstreamed into climate mitigation and adaptation. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights is an instrument that has inspired and continues to inspire international commitments that place us on a better foot to tackle climate change, notably the nine core UN human rights uh, treaties, but also the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development with its SDGs, in particular 13 and 16, the Paris Agreement on Environmental Democracy Treaties, such as the Arthur's Convention and Latin America and Caribbean's Escazú Agreement. Serviced by ECLAC and coming from my region, allow me to briefly refer to the Escazú Agreement in one minute. As the first regional environmental treaty in Latin America and the Caribbean and the first in the world to include specific provisions on environmental human rights defenders, the Escazú Agreement represents a valuable regional contribution to ensuring that environmental and climate actions respect, protect, and fulfill human rights and basic democratic principles. In addition to explicitly recognizing the right to a healthy environment, placing equality at its center and focusing on protection of the most marginalized and excluded, the agreement is a powerful tool for enhancing uh, climate, governance and countering the negative impacts of climate change in the countries of the region. The Escazú Agreement can further support the safeguarding of human rights in the context of climate change by fostering access to climate information, public participation in climate decision making and access to justice in climate related matters and protecting climate activists. I therefore encourage all countries of Latin America and the Caribbean to join this innovative treaty and I take advantage of this opportunity to invite you to attend the third conference of the parties to be held in Santiago, Chile, next 22nd of April, coinciding with the International Mother Earth Day. At ECLAC, we are also making an urgent call to transform our development models and transition to a more productive, inclusive, and sustainable future. What we have learned in Latin America and the Caribbean is that climate justice is not only a legal, but also a moral imperative. First, because Latin America and the Caribbean bear less responsibility than other regions for the causes of climate change, yet it is highly vulnerable to its effects. Second, because despite recent progress, my region continues to be the most unique region in the world in terms of the distribution of income among its population. This, this inequality translates into environmental terms, but is also reflected in gender, racial, ethnic and territorial inequalities, which means that various population groups are lagging behind. And third, because according to repeated reports, it is the most dangerous region to defend the environment, and this situation is totally unacceptable. Far from discouraging us, these facts should motivate us to uh, take further and more impactful actions. We must not forget that human rights are an essential component for the prosperity and well-being of our societies and need to remain at the core of the climate agenda. So let us seize this momentum to make climate rights and justice a reality for all. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for our two opening remarks to set the scene, to set the tone. And now I would like to invite our panelists to share their insights, bringing their perspectives on different efforts and strategies to advance accountability for climate action and inaction through law and policy, including at the UNFCCC. First round of panelist interventions based on guiding questions from the moderator. It will be five minutes, no more, please. <laughs> um, and I would first I would like to give the, the floor to Renée Gift. She's a legal officer at the UN Environmental Program, UNEP. And please, you have the floor. Hi, thank you so much and uh, good afternoon to everyone here. Thank you for coming. Um, I think you need to speak closer to the microphone. Climate litigation has increasingly been making headlines this year. The number of litigants taking to courts to seek justice on climate change has shot up in recent years, but its importance goes beyond the numbers. Climate litigation trends represent an important te litmus test for the state of implementation of environmental rule of law. The justice system is one of the primary mechanisms for enforcement of environmental laws. An effective justice system creates a measure of accountability for governments and for the private sector. And climate litigation has increasingly been driving accountability on climate change. The IPCC's sixth assessment report recognized that climate litigation has influenced the outcome and ambition of climate governance. For those impacted by climate change, and in particular vulnerable and historically marginalized groups, climate litigation has given voice to their concerns and enable them to shape the narrative and drive solutions and climate action. UNEP recently released its 2023 edition of the Global Climate Litigation Report, which you'll see on the left, supported by research from the Columbia Law School. I'll briefly share some key trends noted in the report, which is available online. Climate litigation has doubled by more, has do, more than doubled since 2017, when UNEP first began recording these trends. You'll see on the top left, it went from 884 recorded cases to 2,180 cases in 2022. Cases have been filed in 65 jurisdictions, up from 24 jurisdictions in 2017. This represents not only a dramatic increases in cases worldwide, but notably also in a broader scope of jurisdictions globally. What this means is that there has been an increase in regional representation of cases, including international and regional adjudicatory bodies. Whereas the cases from the US still form the majority of cases filed, an increase in cases from non-US jurisdictions is also clear, showing that access to justice and climate change issues has taken root in more and more jurisdictions around the world. But who, is, who, who has been bringing these cases to court? These cases are being brought by women, senior citizens, children, youth, and, uh, children and youth, indigenous people, and people from small island developing states, and they are driving many of the cases being heard by the courts. By far, the majority of cases has targeted governments for their action or inaction on climate change, but an increasing number of cases has also, uh, also holding private companies accountable for their role. Climate rights stands out as one of the most common grounds on which litigation has been brought. Actions asserting that insufficient climate mitigation or adaptation violates plaintiff's rights, including the right to life, health, food, water, liberty, family life, a healthy environment, a safe climate, and all of these are, have been grounds brought in the courts, and they've been brought at the international and national levels. I'll just leave you now with some key takeaways from these climate trends. First, that the right of access to justice underpins environmental rule of law and an effective judicial system. Courts can act where other branches fail. These trends demonstrate that individuals have been seeking and accessing justice on important issues affecting them. This is only expected to increase around the world as human rights uh, are further recognized and the, at the international national levels and climate change linkages are further being made. 
But perhaps the most important point, climate mitigation has given vulnerable groups and in particular, in vulnerables in particular, important avenues to influence climate policy outside the formal UNFCCC process. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Renee, for bringing the finds of UNEP. Study on, on strategic litigation highlighting the increasing trend to include human rights in climate litigation, which gives a voice to those harmed by environmental degradation, including climate change, to find redress. So thank you. I will now uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Chico King from Tor Torres Strait Aid Claimant and Mazi Gigal, traditional owner, who will share uh, the perspectives well, the case that they brought, the petition they brought to the Human Rights Committee. You have the floor. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Kapakut, good afternoon. My name is Tish Ko King. I say Tish like a fish, and I'm a proud Kukalug woman from Kukugal Nation from the island of Musig and Zenith Kess, known commonly as the Torres Strait Islands. Uh, what, uh, we are part of the First Nations groups of Australia. And so the health of our planets, our planets and as an islander is the health of our oceans, which is intrinsically linked to our human survival. And so right now, Torres Strait Islanders, like many other low-lying island nation states right across this globe, are on the front lines of the climate crisis where urgent action is needed to ensure they can remain on their homelands. King tides, erosion, inundation, and coral bleaching is threatening the homes and cultures of my people. While our government currently refuses to address some of those uh, uh, challenges that we face. Our crisis is being driven by the burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas. And Australia is actually, a, for those that don't know, a petrochemical state that um, is a little bit rogue. We are the second largest coal exporter. We are the second largest LNG exporter. We are the third largest fossil fuel exporter. And we export more emissions than the UAE. And so, in, two, in 2019, uh, eight Torres Strait claimants, uh, in partnership with Client Earth, uh, came, uh, known as the Torres Strait 8, uh, brought a human rights uh, complaint against the Australian government to the Human Rights Committee of the United Nations over the government's inaction on climate change. Last year, on 23rd of September, the Torres Strait 8 made international legal history after the United Nations Human Rights Committee found that the Australian government is in fact violating its human rights obligations to Torres Strait Islanders by failing to act on climate change. The United Nations Human Rights Committee found that the government's poor climate record was a violation of our right to family life, the right to culture under the Global Human Rights Treaty. And it has been uh, made, I guess, really significant change with the International Covenant on Civil Rights political and Political Rights. This complaint was the first legal action brought by people of low-lying islands who are vulnerable to climate damage against a nation state. And so this landmark decision obliges the Australian government to pay adequate comp compensation to our claimants and do whatever it takes to ensure the safe existence of the Torres Strait Islands. It also set pre precedent for Indigenous peoples right around the globe, especially for our Pacific Island nations and brothers and sisters across the ocean. This decision actually marks the first time an international court has found a country has violated human rights law through inadequate climate policy. A nation state has been found responsible for their emissions under international human rights law. And people's rights to culture has been found to be at risk from climate impacts. And so just hearing Renee before about you know, the impact of what climate litigation can do, 
This is, uh, the, this is one of three cases that have come out of the Torres Strait in the last four years. And on August uh, this year, it was in the Australian Financial Review that Australia tops the world in climate litigation. And we now know why as a rogue state. Thank you. Thank you, Tish. I think that's how you prefer to be called. Am I? Yes. Um, for sharing with us how the climate crisis is affecting your lives, livelihoods, and ways of living, basically who you are as people in Torres Strait Islands. The case in question became indeed a landmark case in the international human rights system, setting a precedent for indigenous peoples and other groups around the world. So we should thank you for that. <laughs> uh, the next speaker that I would like to have the pleasure to introduce is Sagarika Stran, founder of Kids for Better World, Children's Advisory Board for the CRC General Common 26. And that's the thing that she's going to be speaking with us right now. You have the floor. Hello. My name is Sagarika Shiram, and I'm an 18-year-old climate advocate based in the UAE. As a child, I feel I should be involved in decision making and being part of the group of people who arguably are the most affected by the climate change crisis currently going on, it is imperative that my opinion and the opinions of the millions and billions of children globally are considered in decision making. The general comment number 26 was created by the Committee on the Rights of the Child to involve children from all across the globe in decision making and including the fact that their rights and decisions are considered um, in all different aspects to parties and states globally. Our goal was to make sure that over 16,000 children's opinions were taken on board and involved when it came to considering their human rights. It is essential in this space that we are considered and we are not left out of this dis discussion in so many different aspects. It's not just that as a child I'm, I'm listened to but I'm not included. I want to feel that my opinion is taken on board and that I am being involved one-on-one -on -one in the decision making and that I'm personally being considered and my rights are being put at the front line of this considering the climate crisis is something that will affect my generation and the future generations to come. <laughs> I want to ensure that when I can look back at this speech and at COP28, I can very confidently say that children are considered, and obviously this COP being as inclusive as it is, I want to know that I was a pivotal part of the decision making that was happening, and that the children who, there's so many inspirational children who are attending this COP, and the millions of children globally who are working towards something just as I am, are being included, and to know that my opinion is making a difference in our society is what makes the climate crisis so personal to me, to know that I really, need to, I am being considered and I'm being heard and my rights as an individual and as a child are at the front line. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sagarika. I mean, you get clapped twice here. Yeah. We are all with you. Uh, and thank you especially for highlighting the importance of children to be involved in climate-related decision-making. It can be no doubt that they must have a pace at the table. They will be, no, they will be here longer than us, and we hope so. Uh, paving the way for those yet to be born and who will inherit this planet, that's our only home. So, and the second point, we need to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Um, I would now we'd like to introduce Michi Singano, Senior Global Policy Lead from the WEDO, Women's Empowerment and Development Organization. You have the floor. 
Thank you so much. Uh, I think it's sort of like a perfect flow from the young people to, to women. As been introduced, my name is Mishi, and I work with Redu, but also I'm sitting here in my capacity as the uh, one of the uh, member of the facilitative committee of women and gender constituency. So I'll speak broadly uh, from the perspective of women and gender constituency, one of the constitu one of the official constituency of UNFCCC. As women and gender constituents, for the longest time, we have really worked to advance gender equality uh, in the UNFCCC process, uh, in specific, but also outside these worlds and these processes. Yes, we understand the narrative that including women make economic sense. Yes, we understand and we agree that uh, women's leadership may have better result. But we don't strongly think that we should just include women because it makes economic sense or because it yields the result. It has to be we are involving them because it's their fundamental right to be in those spaces. Whether it makes economic sense, it doesn't. Because we have seen, for example, it takes, it costs potentially three times more to bring a comrade with a disability who needs support than to bring me. So you cannot say I'm bringing you because it costs me less and excluding the other groups. So I think uh, for the longest time we have been working and want to extend this invitation to you to start changing the narrative beyond economics justification, beyond result justification, to move the conversation on the fundamental right of everyone to live a dignified life and to have a space uh, on this and the decision making table. When it comes to the GST, for example, as we all know this is the GST Corp. Women and gender constituents have engaged for two weeks religiously and committedly to advance uh, human rights and women's rights in the GST. It is unfortunately, however, that we all have seen the text that is out. It doesn't anywhere near reflect the two years worth of work that we have been pushed. Still, we've been asked to be content with the reference in the preamble. Uh, we have been asked to be happy that there might be some language and adaptation. But what's about mitigation? What's about the finances that need to go there? So it's past time that we need to justify and tokenize the right that I can give you a right here and the mention there. To us as women and gender constituency and to you as, 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 as either from the government or from the U.S entities, we are really asking you to work with us and with other civil society to make sure that the first GST strongly center women's rights and human's rights. To us, a GST decision, a good GST decision, which is what we expect, has to have three results. One, it has to protect planetary health and this is uh, important, and I'm sure my colleague uh, will speak about that in terms of phasing out fossil fuel, but it has to protect humanity. Lives have been lost, lives have been lost. We need a decision that protects humanity. And more importantly, while we are protecting or restoring planetary Earth, and while we are protecting humanity, GST decision must advance rights. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mishi. First, to highlight that women should be included not because in these talks, not because it makes economic sense, but because it's our fundamental right to be at the table. And the need to change narratives, and I like very much that point, because we need to change narratives to one that puts people and not profit or other economic interests at the center. Human rights are the road to achieve sustainable development and not the other way around. Otherwise, there will be no justice. So I first of all, like now we are closer to the to the to the speakers. I would like to give the floor to the only man in, in the panel, Harjit. I don't know how you feel about that, but I hope on pleasure. Such a pleasure. <laughs> so let me introduce you first, Harjit Singh. He's the head of Global Political Strategy Climate Action Network. You have the floor. So thank you very much for having me. Um, so I'm going to speak about uh, loss and damage. I, th I think, first of all, we should all celebrate the historic achievement that we uh, got here at COP28, and that too at the very first day, which is absolutely unprecedented. So we should celebrate 
not because it's perfect, but because the way we got it after fighting for it for the last 30 years and we got it over the line against massive resistance and the pushback that we have been getting. I'm sure you know about the stories just before we got the decision at COP27, how particularly the US and many other countries were saying it's just impossible. So we have turned impossible into possible, and it has happened because of the power of collaboration uh, that we could use to make it happen. So it was not one person, one organization, but we all were together. And we should feel positive about what we got because we need those wins to inspire us, right, in this doom and gloom scenario when many things are not really uh, you know, happening uh, the way they should. Now, I think it's also important to reflect how it happened. I'm sure in those four or five minutes, we'll not be able to go into a lot of details. But the way we all worked as UN agencies, as civil society, we worked very closely with media, many government negotiators, not only from developing countries, but also from developed countries. It, these were very intense last couple of years to make it happen, you know, even when the demand came 30 years ago. And it's important to recognize that we were very ambitious. And, and you know, this is not to boast, but as Climate Action Network, way back in 2021, we actually declared that loss and damage finance is going to be the litmus, litmus test for COP26, when actually we didn't see that kind of momentum. So we were the first ones who said, we are going to take it to that level. And let's not forget, that was the first time all the developing countries came together and talked about loss and damage finance facility. Of course, many things changed after that, and we generated more political will. We had flushed in Pakistan. Pakistan was the chair of G77 and China. So many things happened, but the buildup has been going on for several years. And it was COP26 where we got that pivot to really start working on it and getting that kind of attention. And the reason I'm, again, emphasizing all this, that it was not just you know one part of the story. It was a whole choreography. That's the word we used when we talked about how we are going to really land that decision and working uh, in collaboration, as I said, with several stakeholders uh, and taking it to that level. Now, coming to the text, what we got, as I said, is not good enough. Um, there are many challenges. I'll not get into details again because of lack of time. Of course, World Bank be being the host itself is a massive challenge that we are going to face to make sure that people have access uh, to money. Uh, for that, World Bank has to come up with a new avatar. Let's hope it does. That's what it has committed to. And on human rights, the document only you know, pays a lip service. It's only there in the preambular. Uh, uh, section, it is nowhere in the operative part, so how we are going to make sure that human rights of people are, are respected, promoted, so that's going to be a challenge. Um, and of course we know that while wealthy nations, in fact if you talk about putting it into text, it's wealthy nations who were saying yes we are with you and we would like to see human rights, but if you look at their track record around the world, including the wars that are happening, we know how much uh, rich countries really believe in human rights. So putting it in the document is one thing. I think we need to judge by their action and not by words. Now, what we really need to do now going forward, uh, given that there are several weaknesses, it doesn't talk about the scale. Replenishment cycle is like four years, which is extremely weak. Look at the way temperatures have been rising and how impacts are increasing. Uh, there is no mention of how the capitalization is going to happen and how we are going to connect it with mitigation adaptation. So we have several opportunities. Uh, of course, we still have a few more days of negotiation, so how we can make sure that it can be there in GST, as Mishu, you've also been highlighting, how we can make sure that it's part of the overall finance conversation and particularly NCQG, New Collective Quantified Goal, because that's where we are looking at a new number and, and fi the final decision, whether it comes in the form of GST, uh, or as form of cover decision, we need to make sure that it's, it's very much included in that aspect. So what we have achieved here, uh, and just to connect it with several pieces and what we have been hearing, we've got a home for loss and damage finance in the form of a fund. Now the efforts are going to go beyond, because we know in this space the way US and others resisted, and what we got in Paris was a clause saying loss and damage does not amount to or does not become the basis of liability and compensation. To have those principles in terms of reparation, compensation, liability, we will never be able to land in this space. But now that we've got a home, we need to work 
across other streams. So we heard about ICJO. I think that's a great effort. We should all be uh, supporting that and making sure that it becomes real. Litigation, again, we heard about it. That's an important tool that we should be using. And, and how we are going to make sure that accountability is ensured by involving people and their ownership and partnership at various levels so that it's, it's not that money that we are raising goes to just developing countries, uh, but to people. And our accountability is towards the affected people. And as civil society, as the UN system, as media, we should make sure that money actually reaches. And on ICJO, I would like to say, and something that I have been saying, we have to turn that legal opinion into public opinion so that we can actually generate that kind of pressure. So just to wrap it up, I would say, you know, the success that we got, uh, it's kind of a template which we should use to modify and actually take it to other battles. We have a lot of fights to fight uh, for, human for human rights and justice. So let us come together and use this power of collaboration and the kind of diversity and skills we bring. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Harjit, for highlighting the loss and damage fund operationalized on the first day of this COP, which shows that through cooperation, we can still push to achieve what once was considered impossible. We know there is still a lot of work to do within this fund. The challenges are enormous. We can do a side, maybe a whole day of COP just to discuss what the challenges are. Uh, but it shows that we can still have ambition. We should not censor ourselves in what we are putting forward as solutions uh, to tackle the climate crisis. So let's keep pushing. <laughs> There's no other way. Uh, our least, uh, last but not less, at uh, least speaker, <laughs> if you can say that, uh, is Mansi Shah. She's the coordinator self of the Self-Employed Women's Association, and she's here to share some insights on the Just Transition Work Program accountable to people and communities affected by climate change. You have the floor. Thank you so much, and namaste, everyone. I would like to thank the honorable dignitaries and the speakers and the organizers for inviting me to this event and uh, for giving me an opportunity to represent over 2.5 million poor self-employed women workers from the informal economy in India, the members of SEVA. The women whom I represent here today are the poorest of the poor. They are the street vendors, they are construction workers, the smallholder farmers, the salt pan workers, the landless laborers, and so on. Most of these women, are, uh, women workers are not registered, thereby putting them outside the purview of labor legislations and social protection. So Harjitji, thank you so much for pointing out that the loss and damage fund should reach the people, and these are the people who really need the funds, because these are the women who are the most vulnerable. As we all know, climate shocks disproportionately uh, impact the women, especially the informal sector women workers. The employment opportunities available for these workers is never constant due to, uh, you know, severe competition, uh, changing economic uh, policies and market trends, and these are then further compounded by the increasingly frequent climate shocks. Um, these climate shocks thus push the women deeper into the vicious circle of debt and poverty, preventing them from accessing basic human rights. Uh, let me uh, share the story of Puri Ben Ahir, a smallholder farmer from Patan district in Gujarat, having a small land holding of 1.5 acres. Uh, with families growing and land sizes shrinking, uh, agriculture no longer remained uh, viable and profit sustainable for the uh, farmers like Puri Ben, forcing them to switch to uh, you know non cash uh, I mean to cash crops and non organic farming. Now these farmers are forced to buy food from the retail market, uh, which they get at a far higher prices as compared to what they get uh, when they sell their produce. These uh, challenges are further compounded by climate shocks. Like over the past three years in Patan district, uh, the farmers have faced multitude of challenges like droughts, unseasonal rains, uh, extreme heat waves, thunderstorms, and uh, green droughts also. Uh, all of these leading to uh, washing away of the topsoil, uh, damage to standing crops, uh, heavy pest infestation, and so on and so forth. 
So this year, Puri Ben, in just January this year, Puri Ben had a harvest of 1.2 tons of cumin ready to sell. She had just harvested it and put it in her field. And there was a sudden thunderstorm, a lightning strike, and poof, every, everything turned into ashes. Put a very sad and dejected Puri Ben said, what we grow, we cannot eat. And what we eat, we cannot afford. God must be really, really angry with us. That's why he snatches the morsel of food that comes to our mouth. As the family's livelihood shrinks, it impacts their uh, ability to purchase food. And women have this intrinsic, intrinsic nature of putting family first. And therefore, uh, it leads to food and nutrition insecurity for the women. This is not the story of just Puri Ben. It's the story of millions of women workers across the globe, across the countries of the global south. Increasing climate shocks deprive women of basic human rights, as well as right to food, right to livelihood. Uh, it leads to increase in gender-based violence. And therefore, while human rights are being discussed in global discussions and dialogues, as a trade union of informal sector women workers, SEVA strongly believes that there is a need for an inclusive, bottom-up, need-based and demand-driven approach to ensure right to work, right to livelihood, and therefore right to food. Thank you. Thank you, Munsi, for sharing the reality and aspirations of women workers in India and I'm sure that beyond. Just Transition is about workers, including workers in the informal sector, and about communities. It's not about companies getting richer. It's about addressing inequalities, promoting decent work, and reducing poverty. This is why we need to bring this message to the negotiation table. And borrowing a sentence from a, another union leader, just transition without justice is just a transition. Uh, we now came to the conclusion of our round of, of, of speakers. Thank you so much for stick to the time. That means we have about 20 minutes for an interaction with them. So you, can, you are welcome to share, raise your hands and share comments, questions. And I see one already over there. There will be microphones around. So I will start from that side and I will come all the way here. So if you can, if a question is related to someone specific in the panel, please direct it to them. And then we will see if we, if we compile them or we, a few of them or we we'll go one by one. Uh, no, thank you so much for a really powerful panel. My name is Amina Cherimovic and I am a senior researcher at Human Rights Watch focusing specifically on the rights of people with disabilities. And since today is the International Day of Persons with Disabilities, and knowing that people with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by climate change, I would really like to hear from all the panelists um, on how do they include people with disabilities in their work. Um, you know, when it comes to indigenous people with disabilities, children with disabilities, what about women with disabilities, and in addition, also how do we make sure that climate, climate finance also address and includes the rights of people with disabilities? Uh, so that's really my question to all of the panelists. Um, and thank you so much for taking this question. Thank you very much. I would think I'll take another question and then the, you can include those in your final remarks as well. So let's, let's move this way. Yes, please. If it's for anyone in the panel, please, and if you can introduce yourself. Hello, hi. Hi, my name is Cheryl. I work with the Chisholm Legacy Project. Um, we're based in the US. Um, this is a general question as well. Um, this is the eighth year of the UN Decade of People of African Descent. As UN agencies, what are you doing to advance an analysis and an associated framework for action on the intersection of racism and climate injustice as a key human rights issue? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there was any, any other questions in this? Okay, we have a question. I'm going to go like this way. Yes. Uh, I'm Peter Mahal from South Sudan. As a human rights uh, activist team, uh, the climate change is affecting lives of many in a different uh, levels. I I do not know exactly 
whether there is a category on rating and giving the justice based on the effects of each an individual. That is a question that could be answered for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And then I think that you will be next. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Maria Anaya. I am a PhD student at Cornell University from Colombia. Um, so I have a, a brief comment. Uh, my comment is that here at the call we are talking a lot about human rights and its relationship with climate change. And I, I wish judges from the ICJ and also from the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea and also for the, from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights could be here because uh, we all know that there are three different um, oh, advisory opinion requests request before these three, three different tribunals. So I wish they were here just to see uh, and to hear the voices uh, from different people just sharing their experiences and how uh, they really connect, not only uh, like uh, from the legal perspective, but also uh, from the you know, experiences on the ground. So my question, I think it is an open question, but uh, I, I wish um, the representative of UNEP and also I think Tishinko, uh, as apology if I'm mispronouncing your name, but uh, my question is, uh, in what ways do you think climate litigation, and specifically rights-based climate litigation, influence negotiations at the COP or the positions taken by different stakeholders? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have two more hands, is that it? Okay, yes, three more hands and that Four more hands and then we are done. <laughs> Unless we have questions online and then you let me know. Sure. Thank you very much for your insightful presentations. My name is Harry Chikasam. I'm the Human Rights Advisor of the World Blind Union. And uh, my question built on uh, the first question on persons with disabilities. But taking that discourse or conversation within the space of uh, climate litigation, we do understand that uh, persons with disabilities face a mile of challenges when it comes to access to justice alone. And now we are going to climate litigation, which has its own uh, protracted challenges as well. Lots of tests to prove before the court, so issues of causation, issues of local standby and all that, but also looking at the capacity of uh, persons with disabilities or their representative organizations in that space. What advice or suggestions would you have to increase or amplify the disability angle of climate change litigation? Thank you. Thank you. Bula Kavita from Fiji, Climate Action Network. Um, my question is around climate reparations. We talk a lot about justice and then the conversation is about finance and all very important, but fundamentally it is about reparations. And I'd like to understand how can the international human rights law system and processes be used in a way where we can start really having conversations about lobbying and advocating and in research, not just monetary, but really when we're looking at reparations as a whole, what does that mean? Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Claire McGuire. I'm speaking from the International Federation of Library Associations. Um, we are cultural rights champions, and I just came from a workshop in, in Geneva on um, the role of cult mainstreaming cultural rights in preservation, and we spoke a lot about climate change, not only the threats that climate change has on cultural sites and intangible heritage, but also looking at culture and heritage and intangible knowledge as sources of um, climate, uh, climate action and climate knowledge. And so I wonder, general question, if you think the cultural aspect of um, human rights and ju climate justice is being adequately represented in these discussions, and if not, how do we mainstream the cultural rights aspect into a rights-based approach? Thank you. Hi, I'm Shruti Suresh from Global Witness. Thank you so much for a fascinating discussion and for sharing stories from the front line. Uh, my question is perhaps for you, Harjeet, and others as well on, on the panel. 
uh, how do we build on this historic achievement of the loss and damage fund to better integrate human rights into other issues like just energy transition that Mansi you referred to and also for the participation of environmental defenders who are currently under attack globally. Um, and I'm particularly thinking of the solidarity we saw from the Global South on this amazing and historic issue. How do we build on that and how can we bring that in, more, uh, in a more comprehensive way within climate decision making? Thanks. I think there was one more hand in the front and that is, you are our last question from here. Then I don't know if we have one. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Hannah Marcus. I'm a co-chair of the Environmental Health Working Group of the World Federation of Public Health Associations, kind of a long name, but um, my, my background is in public health and uh, we've done some work recently on um, the role of, of public health argumentation and evidence within climate change litigation cases. Um, so I was, I was particularly interested in, the, in, in what you shared about your um, experience with climate change litigation in Australia. Um, and I just wanted to direct a question at you actually asking, um, from your experience with this case, um, what types of evidence were, were generated to support your case? What types of evidence were found to be the most um, effective in, in, in putting forth your argument? Um, and to what degree did you factor in um, issues related to, to health and the rights to a clean, uh, sustainable and healthy environment that has been adopted recently? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm just checking with the UNFGBC if there are any questions online. Okay, so great, <laughs> it works well. Uh, I'm, I can repeat the questions for you, just like a brief summary, and then I'm going to ask like about two minutes each to just make sense of them all. <laughs> uh, so we have questions on persons with disabilities, how they, ha they are included in your work, uh, especially for an intersectional uh, approach, and also how to ensure that climate finance includes them, and any advice to increase or amplify disabilities uh, at COP. Uh, then there is a question also on intersectionality, but that one is on race and climate change. Uh, we have a, a question, I'm not sure I completely understood, sir, but it's about rating of justice and climate change, how we can, we can measure that you know, justice is being achieved. There is a question for UNEP, uh, for Rene and Michi on climate litigation, how, it can how you see there is influencing negotiations at COP and the positions of states. We also have a question on climate reparations. How can the human rights system be used for reparations and what, that, the, would, what would that mean? Uh, on the right to culture, uh, is that being adequately reflected in the negotiations? There is a question for Harjit on how do we build on the historic achievement of the loss and damage fund to integrate human rights in other streams like on just transition and how we can build on the solidarity that we're showing from the south on that. And then Tish, you have a follow-up question on the, on the case on the Human Rights Committee. I think, I hope I summarized well. Uh, so let's continue the same order, Renena, but, but let's try to be very short on our comments, but I mean, it's still comprehensive to give everybody you know, feedback. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you everyone for your questions. I'll just try to attempt to um, respond to some of them. Um, the, one of the, the questions on uh, what we are doing on climate justice and human rights and racism. Um, as you know, we recently published our environmental rule of law report, the second version, which talks about uh, the definition of environmental rule of law and the importance of it for maintaining um, uh, and promoting human rights. And one of the areas that is addressed both in the first and second edition of the environmental rule of law report is um, the role of or how racism, racism can undermine environmental rule of law and it really highlights the importance of this even in environmental management. So I think um, the environmental rule of law report is really like a, a, a sort of, um, or as, is meant to be sort of a gold standard for what uh, we should, um, what countries should establish um, to, to manage environmental, uh, to manage the environment. So the fact that it highlights so much this aspect of racism and what and how um, action against racism or, or racism itself can undermine environmental rule of law I think is, a, is very important. Um, there was another question on uh, 
how climate litigation can inf influence the negotiations at COP. I think um, one of the most important, um, the, the key um, points coming out of climate litigation is so much that it, the impact it has on what countries are doing in their own, uh, the national level in their own legislation. And so, I mean, we often complain about, or, or there, there are often many complaints about countries, what they negotiate and how that reflects at the national level. And I think that's why climate litigation is so important, because this has so many impacts on what countries, uh, governments, what the private sector in their own countries are required to do. Um, so I think that's really the focus of climate litigation. Countries can say things, they can make promises at the, the international level, you know, um, private sectors can, private sector can, uh, you know, they're also bound by the, the national law in which they operate in the countries, but climate litigation has a direct impact on the actions of governments and private sectors in their own countries. Um, and I'll just take one more question, which is um, on the cultural aspect and how this could be, how this could be more mainstreamed into climate litigation. And I just wanted to just quickly draw reference to the example of the Daniel Billy case the, in the, the Torres Strait, Strait Islanders aid case because cultural aspects are exactly what came into play in that case and what, which play, cultural aspects play such an important role in the court recognizing the impact of climate change on the way of life of, of Torres Strait Islanders. And that was important, uh, an important case also because it was one of the first times that cultural aspects were actually raised as, uh, like the right to culture was raised as a, um, um, a reason why uh, government inaction uh, on climate change affected the way of life. And I think the important takeaway is that these points, these, these arguments just have to be made, you know, these, um, countries and litigants are finding more and more innovative ways to link climate change to human rights. And those, those linkages are there to be made. There's, climate change, as you all know, affects our way of life in many different ways. It's up to litigants to find these ways and to argue this before the courts. And I think one, one more point to make is that the outcome of these cases is not so important as to the fact that these cases actually are coming forth and are, are being made. We, uh, litigants um, and governments learn a lot from these arguments and I think that they inspire and motivate, they drive cases, future cases. So even if those cases, those arguments are being made and you know, the case isn't won necessarily on the merits, there's a lot to be gained from just making that case and, and putting, uh, drawing visibility to these issues. Okay, thank you very much, Renee. We will need to be a little short on our answers from now. And there has been a question from the folks following us online, and it's for Tish and Sagarika, and it's actually they want to know how are young people being included in the negotiations? So if you can just add to that, you may have another 10 seconds. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm such a fluffer as well, so <laughs> love yawning. Um, okay, so uh, starting with disability justice is that there are still um, challenges that we're um, sort of facing to find what best suits for, um, you know, specific accessibility needs. But the biggest one is that, and it comes back to what you were saying, is that it's about having a seat at the table and what does that table look like and who is setting it. So we've really shifted the way uh, and where we have our, you know, our gatherings and places to ensure that um, those uh, those voices um, that need to be heard have the capacity and space and a safe space. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, and still always learning to how we can better accommodate our communities for that. Um, to the beautiful woman here in from Colombia, um, to add just to what Renee said is that exactly right. Like coming back from this case was that this case at a UN level was a decision we made versus domestically we, because we wanted this to impact everyone globally. And so parallel to, you know, the text that happens here is UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. And so while, um, you know, this is not ratified internationally, this, um, sort of, sorry, the decision internationally is not ratified domestically for us, uh, our country has an obligation as a party to the rights of Indigenous people to adhere to what 
um, needs to happen. And so we use that uh, to leverage um, for our um, as a way to uh, move forward and continue to shift hearts and minds. Um, cultural aspects, approaches. We, I, I don't think to add more what Renee said, but exactly right. The more that we can centre those different stories of our lived experiences of what we're trying to um, protect, um, you know, that these are our totems. We are the ocean. The more that people feel that, um, the more that they can sort of um, relate to it. And I guess that comes to finding that shared value of the places that we're trying to protect and love. Um, and I think a good segue into um, evidence generated, a part of that was actually to, um, was that I'm onto the third grandparent of picking up the bones um, off the beach like seashells. Um, that was really big evidence of that traditionally our burial sites are located in the centre of our island and there has been massive damage. And I'm looking at Anna and she's telling me to hurry up. Um, and I think um, a part of that evidence was, um, and to that young person online, was that it's actually um, my nephew, who was 12 years old, uh, but at 10 was a voice um, and was one of the evidence witness to climate change and the impacts of firsthand. And it's really important that we exactly right, make sure that we have young people that have a seat at the table and are part of decision-making processes. Thank you. Thank you. Sagarika? Um, yeah, I think Tish put it very, very well. Um, Regarding the question online, I think especially this year, so much has happened since our last COP. And being in a completely inclusive COP this year, children are being considered and their opinions are involved. Obviously, there is a lot more progress to happen, um, but this is definitely a step in the right direction. And then just highlighting the question on involving um, children with disabilities in the climate discussion, I think simplicity is key, specifically when directing information towards children. It can be so overwhelming that you need to break it down. You need to make sure you provide them with visual aids, provide them with the necessary resources to help them educate and adapt themselves to the climate crisis we're facing. And then mainly focusing on things like climate anxiety. I know even personally for me, it can be incredibly overwhelming to even think about the future when it comes to the climate crisis. And thinking about children who face disabilities, that, that's a lot to handle on their plate. So understanding how to manage that all um, and working beside them and having an inclusive discussion is at the key of it. Thank you. Before I, I, I pass to you, Mish, there is one more question online. Uh, and is, the question is how human, the human rights of people living in poverty can be better addressed or considering climate negotiations. So thank you. No, um, just <laughs> thank you. I'll, I'll just uh, attempt to respond to the question of people with a disability, and I think that's sort of like uh, connect to what I've said. We, we, our engagement in the spaces was really based on justifying the costs, what can be done, and for the longest time we have excluded this group. Uh, we are trying uh, as much as we can, and we am here honestly. Uh, you know, holding myself accountable in the constituents that I'm, I'm, I'm representing that we have not been perfect because it's, it's, it's a lot of hard work. And we had a conversation, for example, in Kenya during Africa Climate Week, and we invited women with a disability, and they said to us that they have been uh, massively affected because, for example, the call for evacuation is used through megaphones, uh, but there are people who cannot hear. So if you're using megaphone to ask people evacuate and they cannot hear, then you have condemned those people and you have abused their very basic li right to life. Or even like telling people like run to the hill, like what if they don't have ability to run? So from our articulation, from our response measure, from how we communicate, we are, not we are not including them. And I think we all need to hold each other accountable. Even in our constituency, we don't have a lot of them. But from the women and gender constituents, they have been attempting the effort in this space to have a constituency of people with a disability. And as women and gender constituency and can, we have been really keen to support and to continue those efforts. And we are hoping in the coming few years, potentially, they will formally be formalized so that their voices can be heard. Because 
because we also don't want to be um, we don't want to be a middleman for their voices. They need to be here and speak their own truth and tell their own stories. Um, when it comes to last question that I will attempt to respond and question around the racism, I think with all fairness, racism, sexism, capitalism, and colonialism, and all those cism are the system of oppression and destruction that mutually reinforce themselves, and they have are the system that get us here. So we strongly feel that unless we claim the audacity to disrupt and dismantle this system, we are only going to be making rounds and rounds and coming here every day. So we strongly need radical solutions to radical problem because you are not living in the normal times and you don't expect to change abnormal situation using the normal uh, solutions. And we need to have tough conversation. The conversation around the returning the money that was stolen, AKA or as politely named the reparation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hajit. Okay, um, because a lot of questions have been answered. Just to build on, on the disability part, I come from development and, and humanitarian work. For us, the first step was to identify the most vulnerable people at the local level, because we can keep talking of policies, but the real work needs to happen there. We mobilize them, we promote their agency, so we don't just see them as vulnerable, but how do we bring them together, recognizing their rights, advo advocating for structural, non-structural measures, resources, but most importantly, participation. So this is something that we have been doing and very important for our work on adaptation and addressing loss and damage, you know, though the basics and, of course, on mitigation. Um, on the issue of reparations, again, a lot has been said. The only thing I would, I would say in terms of contextualizing, we need to look at the whole climate action from a cause and consequence point of view. You know, if you are saying fossil fuel is the cause and the consequence is loss and damage, but the reality is that these polluters are not being held to account. With some of these litigation cases, you know, even if you are not winning and we know the challenges, uh, but this is extremely um, uh, important to make sure that the whole ecosystem is built that puts pressure on polluters to, to then act. Uh, there was a thing about climate finance, and this is also a plea because we know that we all are talk about we all talk about intersectionality, and we all push our issues. But I must tell you, we need to go really beyond the language that we get in these negotiations, and that's where imagine whatever language we want to get. And please don't take me otherwise. You know, I also come from you know sectoral work. We would like to see our language on women, women's rights, and children's rights, and disability getting reflected. That's absolutely important. But the most important thing is we need to start seeing money flowing. If there is no climate finance, the text will remain. And some of the champions that you see coming from rich countries are very good at getting it in the text. Ask them about money. If you are not giving money, you are violating their rights. You want them in the text, but you don't want them to be supported with real money. So challenge them on that. We need to unite our fight and not look at you know, only from your own perspective, only from, through your own you know, community uh, aspects. That's important. But that's only the first step. The bigger step is fighting the big fight. And it, I must say, climate finance is the elephant in the room, which is not even there in the room, right? Unless we have climate finance, we'll not be able to achieve climate justice. And that's where we all must unite and fight together. That's the leaf that we should take from the whole loss and damage fight that we had. And let me connect that to the next point. I don't think I'll be able to give you specific answers, but what we did, we differentiated between technical and political aspects. We looked at our work from local to international level, including national. We actually did a very deeper analysis of who is our ally, and I must tell you it's not binary. It's not only looking at developed and versus developing countries. There are many of our friends in the developed world. Uh, developing countries, we are not asking for money for governments. It's for people. Governments are just conduit, some of those things that we used, and our primary accountability is towards affected people and rights holders. So how do we look at, you know, and, and it's applicable across all the issues as you asked, but of course, in, if you don't have much time, I'm very happy to engage further if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll just, uh, I mean, because most of the questions have already been addressed. I'll just address the one question on solidarity. Um, so, uh, I mean, 
coming from an organization, a union of uh, women workers, what I have seen, well, what we have seen is that when it comes to building women's climate resilience and climate uh, strengthening their climate action, uh, the right to food, livelihood, clean water, clean air, clean energy are all basic rights of women. And to ensure access to these, there is a need to organize. We have all learned and we strongly believe that rights must be demanded bottom up not requested to be handed down uh, to the poor women. And therefore, organizing women, collectivizing them, building their collective bargaining power, negotiating power is the key. And, uh, but we also acknowledge but that with rights comes responsibilities. Responsibility towards nature, towards humanity, and towards one's own self. And therefore, SEVA has launched a Clean Skies campaign that focuses on uh, creating awareness and education for women about climate change, but also the impact on their lives and livelihoods and of their action. It, it looks after, it looks at how do you identify what are the energy solutions or clean solutions and enables facilitating access to them. And it works on aggregating the carbon savings of these women through their small, small climate actions and linking them to the carbon market, thereby generating clean, green energy solutions, but also livelihood solutions for women. This is what at SEVA we call just transition. Transition that generates green livelihoods and employments which are decent and dignified. Thank you. So, yes, more. I think like they deserve more. more. <laughs> the event is not done. We are closing to the end, but we still have two speakers to come. First, I would like to invite for closing remarks Michelle Force, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Environmental Defenders under the Aarhus Convention. You have the floor. You have to come here. Yes. <laughs> to me. <laughs> Thank you, Anna Paula. And I guess I have more than three minutes, or? You have maximum. No, time. okay. <laughs> well, that's a joke, because I've prepared well in advance my, my statement, in fact. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to be here, and to and thank you for the, to the organizers for um, inviting me to uh, um, give some, some concluding remarks to these uh, uh, wonderful uh, panel discussions uh, on climate justice. And, it is something very important for me uh, today to have defenders uh, at the table uh, as the main speakers to discuss on climate justice uh, uh, and more specifically on accountability uh, on climate justice uh, uh, and uh, at the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. I'm very glad that was the case today. I've been uh, really impressed today by all your testimonies uh, uh, your um, efforts and your brilliant strategies to advance accountability for climate action. And thank you also for reminding us uh, that we can win battles uh, if we, try, we can join our forces. Uh, and indeed, uh, as you rightly pointed out, uh, uh, the loss and damage funds is an incredible win, uh, but we must continue the fight, the fight uh, to include a clear language uh, on participation of human rights defenders and indigenous peoples in decision-making processes. But I also like to remind us of an, another anniversary, uh, because it is also the 25th anniversary of the UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders uh, that was adopted on the 9th of December 1998. And clearly, at the table, defenders like you embody uh, the right to defend human rights. Uh, and we heard today very inspiring examples uh, of what it means uh, to be a human rights defender and to use all possible means, including litigation, to claim your rights. And this is why, at the UN, we must ensure that defenders can effectively exercise their rights every day, on every continent, in every country. And this starts, for me, with the inclusion and meaningful participation in decision-making, in decisions that affect them in decisions that affect the exercise of their human rights. Discussions on how to address climate change is a good 
but it's an unfortunate example of the lack of safe and meaningful participation of defenders, and especially indigenous peoples, in the decision making. Most indigenous peoples are at the front lines of the defense of environment. And yet, while they are usually those who contribute the, less, the least to environment degradation and to climate change, they are also those the most affected by it, those the least consulted in discussions on what to do to reverse the trend. And they often suffer uh, further violations of their human rights uh, because the decisions made uh, in discussions uh, where they were not involved. I cannot help uh, but think of all my meetings uh, with climate activists uh, and environmental defenders, uh, including children defenders, uh, since I've been appointed last year to this new mandate uh, as special rapporteur on, on environmental defenders. Uh, women environmental defenders uh, uh, gave me moving testimonies uh, of gender-based violence uh, by law enforcement officers, including the UK. Environmental defenders uh, shared with me concerns uh, and testimonies uh, of the violation of their rights. Uh, many of them uh, spoke of the lack of proper access to information, proper public participation, and access to justice, uh, the three pillars of the Oris Convention and the Escazú Agreement. Uh, this is, for me, a clear illustration of the lack of political will by states uh, to implement their obligations. Believe me, the so-called green transition to fight climate change cannot be achieved and will not be achieved without meaningfully involving those concerned. And even more, if this fight is conducted without the affected communities, without the defenders, it further endangers them. I could share many examples, uh, and I probably don't have time to do that now. And here at COP28, uh, and in every other international forum, this is something that we must fight for. The recognition of the role of environmental defenders, uh, including indigenous peoples, uh, in the fight against climate change, against pollution, and biodiversity loss. Congratulations again to the organizers and sponsors for a very inspiring discussion, and I'm looking forward to uh, healing and to listening to the poem of Emmy to close this event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle, for your words and also for introducing our next uh, and last uh, speaker of the day. But she's going to be the last one to take the floor. So I just wanted to ask you all. Um, close to the door, there are some of those lanyards, so it's saying human rights and civic space for climate action. That's how we identify ourselves, those who are pushing human rights. We are wearing those, and we want the entire room to be this color. So please, uh, at the end, towards the door, you can just go and pick it up. There is there for you to take. Uh, and also, we like to have a picture with everybody at the end. So once and I would like to introduce you properly, <laughs> uh, finishes her, her, her poem. Uh, maybe we can all come. I don't know how it's going to play out, but we will try. Just let's, let's get together and have a picture. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce you to Mtitao Mahmoud Emi, uh, who is a poet, activist, and a goodwill ambassador for UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. We are all here to listen to your words. Please join us. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. oh sorry. Uh -huh. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. This is an amazing panel. I'm so proud of you. I'm proud of all of you, but I'm proud of you. Um, I just want to say thank you for having us. And also, just it is such an honor to be a part of this event and to know that we're making a lot of space relatively a lot of space <laughs> for human rights and for um, the, you know, the, the requests that we need because the reality is, and you, you said it so well earlier, that um, it's not enough to include human rights in a performative way. It's not something that you just say. We need um, action beyond commitments. And so how, does, how is it that we drive change and how is it that we can not just operationalize, but actually 
create some sort of action and accountability in these spaces. The reality is that you know I'm from Sudan, from Darfur, um, and places like Sudan and other uh, countries as well that are often relegated to the periphery of what the world deems as important are constantly left behind. And centuries of structural violence lead to millions of people dying every year. And when people talk about these things, they talk about them as crises or inevitabilities or you know, tragedies, they don't talk about them as problems. Problems have solutions. Um, and I think that's one of the most important things for us to say, that we can't purport to be innovators and you know, people who are changing the world if we're not putting that same mindset to some of the most difficult and urgent problems of our time. What I saw in Cameroon recently, I was just in the Sahel um, visiting Minowau camp. Uh, it's a refugee camp and Bogo which is an IDP camp as well in the north of Cameroon and Marwa. Uh, what I saw was just the most incredible innovation happening on the front lines. So what I say is that refugees, displaced people, indigenous people like myself, um, and also refugee, <laughs> that's a long story, but um, we, <laughs> we're not just on the front lines of crisis, we're at the forefront of change. And if we're not valued and recognized in that same way, and um, our knowledge is not valued as equally as other people who might might be more mainstream, et cetera, et cetera, um, then we won't be able to create the kind of change that is needed to really shift the paradigm. Three, five refugee leaders got together in Minowau camp several years ago and decided to plant trees. They planted 500 trees, and now it's hundreds of thousands of trees with a little bit of support. And they've successfully reforested part of the Sahel. And they have cocoon technology, which is incredible. It means that you can plant trees even in the dry season. And BioBriquette program, and now they're collaborating with companies and teaching um, the local host community as well how to create clean energy. So there's clean energy in the camps. There's all of these different things happening. But again, it doesn't fit the narrative, the narrative that we are to be helped and we are beneficiaries and that everyone else is benefactors. It doesn't fit that narrative, so it isn't highlighted as well as it should be. The last thing that I want to say is that my dad is from a village called Jack. Jack doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist anymore. I know you're laughing because if you don't laugh, you cry, right? Jack does not exist anymore. A uh, combination of climate, conflict, a lot of, our, um, a lot of us are from spaces where you know you come into a space like this and you'll hear people talk all over about like, oh, we're gonna face extinction like the dinosaurs. And I'm like, what do you mean like the dinosaurs? There's much more recent examples, myself included. Um, so for me, what I wanna say is that when I wrote this poem, I was thinking about all of those different things and just calling back to the knowledge of our families and knowing like, for example, um, during the famines in Sudan, women-led households survived longer because the knowledge that the women had to really bring resources forward from the earth is so powerful and so important. So how do we pour resources into this? How do we mobilize the resources here at COP and put them into these solutions that really matter and not hear excuses about capacity building or whether or not people are ready to receive or have the infrastructure to receive? And I hear this language a lot and it really bothers me, it drives me insane. So I uh, studied anthropology and molecular cellular developmental biology at Yale. I got a certificate in global health and I'm going into medicine, but I choose poetry because I believe that when you talk to somebody politically, they'll respond politically. If you talk to somebody academically, they'll respond academically. And if you speak to them with hate, they'll respond with hate. But if you speak with your humanity, they'll respond with their humanity. And that is what I'm hoping will happen here at COP. We'll start responding with our humanity and putting our money where our mouth is. <laughs> so this poem is called The Song of the Earth. I just got a signal for time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I hope you like it, and I hope it um, keeps you going in these moments. We need you, and it means a lot to be here. So, The Song of the Earth is sung in morning dews and honeysuckle tones. It's resting in the bends of the Nile. And waving across the leaves of a weeping willow, the song of the earth is humming in the depth of our bones and crescendos when a sprout first breaks through the soil or a child takes its first breath reaching toward that painted sky. It whispers when the birds fly home for the winter and wails when some of them don't return. The song of the earth is relentless. 
It is a retelling of warnings of old and a cry for help to those who still listen for it, who still feel it resonating. It is a presence deep beneath the concrete, a lamenting generations in the making, a pleading to remember who we are. I didn't know what I was missing until I went back home and saw the clouds, high above the skies of Darfur. I tried to make sense of it, lingering day after day. When I finally asked my uncle Bakri, he says, that's not a cloud, it's the Milky Way. If you're ever lost, just follow the Milky Way home. How could I explain to him just how lost I was? How could I make him understand just how far we'd strayed from the knowledge of our ancestors? How could I tell him that the sky hadn't been blue in a very long time, and the stars hadn't shone past a few in years, that getting fresh air was a luxury, and experiencing nature a distant dream for most of us, and that the Milky Way, the sight of it a birthright I did not know was mine, was a stranger to my eyes. When did we become trespassers? When did we forget how to listen to the world around us? When did we lose the connection to what makes this our home? We are as much a part of nature as a sapling or a waterfall, earth and inheritance shared by all of us, but no longer equally. People and planet are one and the same. Forgetting this will be our downfall. My friend Forrest told me that deep beneath the layers of the Sahel and all across our world, mycelia connect everything, like the neurons in one organism. I wonder when we lost the power to feel those signals. We, absentee members of nature connected in crisis, thousands lost in Libya, Morocco, land, sea, and sky, human lives caught in the balance, human life caught in between, firestorms in Hawaii, earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, Hurricane Idalia, floods in New York and China, cyclones, evacuations of hundreds of thousands. The thing about resilience is it becomes harder to do without your tools. My people, we draw on home, but we have been forced from home. We draw on community, but disaster has torn us apart. The earth, it draws on balance, all things in homeostasis, but we have broken that balance. It is in hubris that makes us believe we can possess the earth, that we can take and give nothing back. It is forgetfulness. It is memories that were held in the hands of our elders before they had the chance to pass it down. When the earth stood still, we had a moment to remember. Removed from the equation, her earth had a chance to recover. There were deer in the city streets. The skies shone blue as the sea once was. The birds came home and the waters cleared and the ozone hole began to close. Seeing how the earth grew in our absence became a reminder that the earth responds. So can you hear it, the song of the earth? Can you feel the falcons calling? Can you sense the wind carrying the voices of the trees? Can you taste the drops of long-awaited rain and smell the cooling clay as it seeps below? Earth still works. We just stop doing our part. My mind may forget, but my body remembers the things my grandmother knew, that nature gives us, and more importantly, what we must give back. The roads our ancestors walked memorized like the veins on the back of our hands, moving in harmony, sharing a destination and a source. When I stand in the desert, I now know that the sand has memories of greenery and beneath it all, dreams of return. What connects us is so much more than desperation or loss or fear of catastrophe. What connects us is our shared memory of our home planet, our love and fear of water, how we gaze at the stars and the stars gaze back. It is in our laughter and the home we carry in our hearts. It's in our voices and the stories we tell with our souls. It's in our future and the paths we will forge together. It's in this moment and our chance to begin again, our chance to learn to love something without possessing it to see a bird in flight and not cage it, 
to marvel at the earth and not claim it, to become who we used to be, lovers of all things green and warm. My godfather Timothy reminds me, a river that forgets its roots will soon dry up. This is your reminder. Home is calling. Will you answer the call? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Kindly please use the door on the left for exiting. Please use the door on the left to exit. Thank you.